this. Better? In the back, you can hear me? Yep. So, at least now it's not the um, volume that if you can't understand me, it's probably my Dutch accent and uh, not the thing. So, my name is Andre Kammer. I'm a, a SQL Server MVP from the Netherlands. So, if you have any questions at all about the Netherlands, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me know. And no, I have never in my life been, been inside a coffee shop. I have no idea how that works. <laughs> I don't smoke. I, I do know there's the smoking ban inside uh, 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 restaurants and everything. You have that here, but you cannot smoke inside a, a cafe or something. Uh, you can't do that in a coffee shop either. You can only smoke cannabis inside a coffee shop, not normal cigarettes. This is all I know about coffee shops. <laughs> so any other questions? As long as it's not about coffee shops, who would thank Do you need anything from the store? Says so Renamar. Yeah, can you bring me a bottle of water? I was not expecting a thing. <laughs> Probably because I brought him a bottle of whiskey yesterday. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, remoting with PowerShell. I'm not going to go in too many technical details. Um, if you've seen, um, probably, I haven't seen it myself, but I've seen it before, Romance Session, uh, before this one. It's deep technical stuff for about an hour. I'm not going to do that. Um, no, I, I, <laughs> this, this is more about, I, I, I can show you what I did and why, uh, and I'll show you some of the technology and explain what you need to take care of when you start working with it yourself. But the main thing is that I want to tell uh, you why I did this. And if you think that's useful, you can run with it and do something of your own. You can hopefully use it. But I'm not going to give you a full set of scripts that you can take home and run the complete scripts. Just some bits and pieces. Uh, <coughs> bits and pieces. <coughs> I'm guessing this is uh, thanks to our sponsors or something. I have no idea. I was listening yesterday to the uh, prize drawing at the end, and um, I do this myself. I have SQL Saturdays in Holland, and then at the end we do a prize drawing. So you grab the microphone, and you start speaking in Dutch to everybody, and then you make a joke and everybody laughs, and there's a couple of English-speaking speakers at the, at the side, and they laugh as well, and they applaud. They have no idea what I do. <laughs> and I, I, I found myself doing the same thing yesterday. I was smiling and applauding. No idea. I'm guessing this says, uh, because of all the sponsors, um, thanks to all the sponsors, th these things are not possible. I know this, I, I do these things myself. These things are not possible without sponsors, so thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm SQL Server MVP. I, I started in IT, my first paid job was when I was 19. I will be 41 a week from now. So, I've been in IT a long time, um, an old trader, and I, I run the Dutch um, Basque chapter. I actually, I've put my blog underneath, I haven't blogged in over a year, and I've been to a couple of conferences in, in the last couple of weeks where I said, but I'm going to start blogging soon, and I'm going to do the same promise here. Keep an eye on it, I don't know. Um, well, and my Twitter handle is there. Um, if you can read Dutch, it would probably be more interesting, but I do think in English somehow. So, like I said, this stuff, I do this because I used it somehow, and uh, I think it's interesting enough to tell you about it, but I, I have to put a trademark on it. This is the works for me trademark. I do it this way. If you go to my session and you listen to me and you think at the end, nah, it doesn't work for me, I'm not going to use it. Good. I just uh, saved you some time. I told you in one hour that it's not for you. You can go on and use what you think is good, right? So, <clears throat> sometimes also I talk about stuff that I do on a daily basis and I can handle any questions that you fire at me. Sometimes eh, I, think, I think it's interesting when I talk about it. But it's not really my day-to-day -day stuff. It's kind of new for me as well. Uh, let, let's see if you fire some questions at me if I can handle, handle it. 
right now, for the last half year, I've been building a queue in analysis services. That's scary when, you, when you've done databases. I'm a, I'm a DBA guy. And I've done databases for a long time, and then they ask me, can you build a queue? Um, no. <laughs> can you try? Sure. Well, I work for a, a, a bank on the risk analysis department, and those cubes can be pretty complex. It's, that, uh, it's scary sometimes when you have to calculate the, the amount of risk the bank runs, and you, I, I had a, a hole in, in, a, in my calculations at some point of 40 million euros, and I called the guy and said, we cannot go live, I'm 40 million off. I said, nah, it's fine, 40 million. <laughs> Why do you think it's fine? Well, look at the total. And I look at the total, it says 165 billion or something. Uh, so, yeah. they weren't too worried about it. Really. We found it in the end, though. It wasn't lost. And it was not in my bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, uh, oh. we went to Marche's house yesterday. <coughs> And he said, let me show you my wine collection. And he opened up lots of boxes, and there was a lot, was a lot of wine in there. And I looked at it, and I just grabbed the one bottle of nice whiskey that he had hidden between it. Uh, we drank whiskey from, and wine from a coffee cup, so it was very interesting. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So... First, let me tell you why I started using a PowerShell. So, first of all, who uses PowerShell? Laura has tried to use PowerShell. All right. Who does stuff on more than one server? And has used PowerShell to do stuff on more than one server at one time? All right. I... So, before I started doing that cute thing I told you about, I was at the DBA department where we have 400 instances of SQL Server. At one point, I needed to set up um, log shipping for the SharePoint site. <coughs> uh, he's going like that. And um, I'm going to make it worse. I used the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can see me. I, I used the GUI just once. It'll be fine. So the, the thing says, it, when you try to set up log shipping, you make a full backup, right? That's where you start. And the, the wizard does the same thing, and it, it will ask you, where do you want to make the full backup? And there's a button that says, where you can say, I want to make the full backup at the default location. I was thinking, the default location is where I've told SQL Server where to put the backups, right? No. Um, actually, what that stupid wizard means is where the master database is which in our situation is a tiny drive. So I put a really huge backup on a tiny drive, didn't work, crashed something, I had to try it again. I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna build a script next time, I'm gonna try it one more time. This is always the point where you, do I script this, do I use the widget, right? Um, made the backup, started to copy the backup. So what happens if you have a system that's busy, uses a lot of memory, you make a 100 gigabyte backup and you copy the thing. You know, right? <laughs> At some point, the operating system, so copying the last file takes up a lot of memory, and the Windows did not have enough memory and decided to put something in the page file, as Windows does. In my case, it decided to put SQL Server in the page file. And, and at that point, I just killed the whole SharePoint environment for the whole bank. Every, all the local banks, everything. All of them. SharePoint did not work because this stupid idiot tried to copy the file. So, manager comes up and says, what just happened? I explained to him. Uh, I said, we need to switch on the lock pages in memory, which uh, if Windows wants to put something in the base file, it cannot take SQL Server anymore. SQL Server just won't allow it, and it will take something else. Remember that, because this is important for later on. It will take something. Um, so I promised the manager, this will not happen again. Um, I switched on uh, lock pages in memory, and tried the whole thing again. 
having just blown up the whole SharePoint environment, and I apologize, I said, you need to send out an email to everybody. I fill out these forms and make some pretty serious about this stuff. It doesn't work. Um, so I tried it again, and fair enough, I didn't look at the memory settings that SQL Server had. They were pretty high. But the operating system, when I tried to copy the file again, did not have enough memory. But I thought I had it because it couldn't put SQL Server in the base file, so everybody, everything can keep, will keep on working. Well, no. Um, Windows just said, let me try and find something else to put in the base file. And it, it couldn't find enough, and it ran out of memory, and then it starts to sh shut down stuff. And in my case, that was the TCP IP stack. <laughs> <laughs> I found it later in the error log. It said, uh, uh, SQL Server has stopped listening on board number such and such. So I think I broke the record of killing something that's important to the bank twice in one day. And I got some serious questions from higher management. Who is this idiot that the brave thing is going? So it's at that point, this, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> at that point, uh, management comes up and says, okay, what happened? Why did it happen? You, you tried to fix it. Why didn't the fix work? You fixed it again. Why did that work? Then I fixed it by lowering, just lowering the memory. Just give the OS some memory, right? Um, and then the most important question, and then we get to this stuff. We have 400 of these things. Uh, which servers have this problem? How are the memory settings? Uh, we have, you, you couldn't switch that on for standard edition at the time. Now you can with a trace flag, but you couldn't at the time. Um, that there are blockages of memory. Um, so, I had to investigate 400 instances on all these problems. Memory set, memory settings, lock pages in memory, whether it's standard or end of enterprise, etc. I used to have a colleague there, he's still there, I'm not in that department anymore. No, they didn't give me anything. <laughs> but um, he would make an Excel sheet with 400 servers in it, divide them in different tabs set the Excel sheet on the central location and just assign it to us. And we would have to take one of the tabs and then just go through them and check all the servers by hand. Now, who hates doing that? Yeah, not everybody. <laughs> oh, there are some lazy people here that just want to have it. When you're getting paid for it by the hour, you just want to go through an Excel sheet? No, I don't. So that's when you grab, when you, that's when you try to make a script. I, PowerShell is pretty cool with that stuff because you can look in, inside SQL Server and you can uh, do stuff on the OS and uh, it doesn't really matter if you want to look inside SQL Server or on the outside or on the OS or it doesn't matter. That PowerShell is really cool about that. So you make a script that can do that for you. But then you still need to run it on 400 servers and that's where remoting can come and that's when you can really use the power of remoting. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions in between, not just about Holland, but anything. Let me Well, I drink from this huge. So, you can do some remoting stuff without PowerShell. Um, uh, without PowerShell remoting, there's um, remote stuff built in the standard commands that we know, like shutdown. It just has a, a slash M and you put in the machine and, and it will just shut down any machine that you want. Very cool if you make a mistake there. Uh, it, so, if you shut down the wrong machine, not reboot, but shut down, but you have to, I have to go to the Windows guys and they have to go to the, the lights out cart that's in the box because the machines are all in the data center. And I have to ask them to switch on the server again. And that's costing me a bottle of something every time. They don't like that. I once forgot my password. They reset my password, I forgot it, I had to come back three times. And then they gave me a password like, Andre is pretty stupid and he can't remember passwords and I got like a password like this. So I'm pretty careful of what I do with the window guys, what I ask them. Because they were, they like teasing. So in PowerShell itself, 
you can do remote stuff as well without using PowerShell remoting. There's, there's a whole bunch of commands that can do remoting. Uh, the get WMI object, for instance, you can get WMI uh, stuff from any computer by just putting dash computer name and then put the computer name behind it. So, and, and if you want to know which commands do have remote options, you can just type get help parameter computer name and it will give you all the PowerShell commands that have a computer name parameter. So you can do remote stuff with that. But you just want to use your own scripts, right? You, you've ran into a problem, you've fixed it, you've, you've, you've built a script that can query the machine if it, if it has a problem, if the, you can check the machine with that script, and you just want to run that. <coughs> and you don't want to rely on all the PowerShell commands that do have remote capabilities. You just want to run it on certain computers. This is where PowerShell remote comes in. Now, setting it up is not very hard. You just type in enable BS remoting on the box that you want to control. So not on your box where you want to file the command, but on the box where you want the command to run. That, that's where you type in enable BS remoting. That's all you have to do. There's a service on every machine that's called WinRM, Windows Remoting. Um, the enable PS remoting switches that on, plugs a hole in the firewall, and I think it does some other stuff to make this possible. One thing you have to take care of, uh, or, or at least remember, there's also a disable PS remoting. It does not disable Windows remoting. This is a bit weird because it, it's called disable, right? But it does certain stuff. It does not switch off the... Um, uh, the service, it does not plug the firewall hole that you've just uh, made, and the, there's some other stuff that it switches off, so remoting won't work anymore, but it doesn't switch off everything. Yeah, that's easy. that's uh, something you have to remember. So inside the domain, it's easy. <coughs> just run enable PS remoting on all these boxes that you see here, except on um, this one. Uh, here's the DBA, he wants to run commands on that box. And you just need to run enable PS remoting on all the other boxes. And you're done. It's that simple. But you have switched it on. If you don't have a domain, this is the picture on the left here. If you don't have a domain, you need to um, set trusted hosts. If, so if you're in a domain, everything is simple, right? You just, the, the DBA that runs the command just needs the rights to run whatever he wants to run on the box, uh, like if he would be on that box itself. That's the rights you need. If you are not in a domain, you can have a username that's the same on that box, and a password that's the same, and you suddenly, suddenly the, the machines think you're the same person, which does not need to be true. So for that case, you need to set trusted hosts where you explicitly tell the SQL 1 box in this example, that he can accept commands from the monitor host box. You don't have to do that in this example. It's not necessary. In this example, if you're in a domain, enable PS remoting from the box and you're done. There's another important thing. If, you, For instance, you work with SharePoint. Uh, SharePoint has PowerShell command lists, but SharePoint is sometimes set up as a farm where you have multiple SharePoint servers. And then those PowerShell commands want to go from one server to the other. But now suddenly you're here, monitor host, you fire the command to SQL 1, and it wants to fire a command to SQL 2. That's where the credentials of the DBA have to move to the other box. And the SQL 1 should be allowed to do that. And that's why you have to allow the credential delegation, or else it won't work. So if you run into something that you run on SQL 1 and it does stuff on SQL 2 as well, and that works. You move it to the monitor host, and you run it there, and it won't work. Try the uh, credential delegation. It's, it's a setting that you set uh, either on the box itself or in Active Directory, allow, allow delegation or something. Yeah. Right. Um, running a command on our. On our, on our 
on a remote box is really easy. It's just invoke command. That's all you have to do. Invoke command, dash computer name. Here's the computer name thing again. Um, give it a computer name and dash script block and just put the block of commands that you want to run behind um, between parameters. That's all you have to do. That, that top command on the, on, the, um, on the slide will just run get process on SQL 1. You can do that on multiple computers. You can say computer name SQL 1, comma SQL 2, and it will run that same command on both machines. Easy, right? Now we've got something that you can run on multiple machines. Well, if you have 400, you don't want to do SQL 1, comma SQL 2, comma SQL 2. So that's where um, the third option comes in. You can put a PowerShell command uh, behind the dash computer name. So what he's actually saying is run the <coughs> script block that I'm giving you on all the machines that are in this computers.txt. So now you can give it a uh, now you can give it a, a list of computers, and you can say run this script on this list of computers in one command. How, how cool is that? Nearly that. Is. Can you run that against Western servers, say so groups or hierarchies of Western servers. Say so I want to run it against this data center, and it has then all the servers that are registered, it will, it will iterate through them. So basically, it depends on what you put in the, in, the, in the get content command. You can do anything in PowerShell that you want, right? You can, um, you can say, uh, uh, give me the list of computers, but it's, it, can, it can be a comma separated thing. It doesn't have to be a text file with just the name of the, just the, name of the computers. You can say import CSV. Let me see. Uh, no. I've got an instance list. Oh, it's a CSV file. So if I just do this, uh, where is it? It's on C monitor. CD. I keep hearing people saying that present a lot. Don't type in a demo. This is why. Um, so there's a, a, a CSV feed. So let's see what's in there. Uh, probably have to do this. Uh, it just has the instance names. But you can, um, if I put. Um, Server, data center, DC, DC, SQL 1, A, SQL 2, B. There we go. Um, save it here as a CSV file. CSC, um, it's maybe the CSC, it doesn't matter. What you can do in PowerShell. Say import CSV um, name test, and it will show you the, um, the CSV file. It will just it knows that it's a common separated file, so you can do stuff like um, where the current of DC. And that, and that you can do in this get content. You don't have to do a get content. You can do an import CSV and and pipe the command until you get to the server name that you want to give. So you can say, give me all the test boxes or all the dev boxes or all the SQL 2005 machines or whatever you have in that CSV file. You can do whatever you like. Or run a PowerShell command right before it that creates a text file and has only that in there. And just add one more line. You can be creative there. That's really better, right? Um, what was I? Oh, yeah. So, instead of giving it a script block at the end where you have to type the command that you want to run on a machine, you can also give it the name of the file that you want to run. So suddenly you have two files. You can just say, uh, instead of script block, you say file path, 
and give it the, the path of the, uh, the, the, the name of the command it will run, just put it in a file. So now you can say okay, with one line, run this on these servers. Right? Makes it really easy. This this is what I use at this point, I suppose. Uh, for my um, uh, SharePoint problem, I had I'd, I'd written this PowerShell script that would get all the information I needed. I just put it in a file. I, I had a text file with all the machines. Just put the info command there. Run this script on those servers. There you go. Done. Uh, okay. Not completely true. We had to enable PS remoting on all the boxes because this is the first time we used it, and that required uh, an. Uh, a, a change control and everything, so forms to be filled out and approvals and, and after hours work, so there was a lot of work uh, to be done before that, but we decided to do it anyway, and then the PowerShell, uh, the um, SharePoint thing was fixed, and many more stuff that we wanted to do afterwards. If you, actually, the um, enable PS remoting thing was the last time we went through this Excel sheet with all the servers, with all of us. Because everybody had to file up a change control thing and get approvals and call people and swear that it doesn't break anything. Well, and it didn't. Uh, so that's good. You know that's how this works on important stuff, right? If you change something, however unimportant, and some of their stuff breaks right after it, they're gonna blame you. They're gonna say that's it broke it. So you don't you won't be careful. Um, one thing to, to mind out, the um, bottom command, where you put the, instead of um, the script block, where you put the name of a, um, a script inside the script block instead of the file path, now you're pointing at a script that's on the target machine. So this, this thing here, um, C script run this, at PS1, you're giving that command to the remote machine and it's going to look there for that script to run. Um, so anyone that has run a PowerShell command before knows that you have to enable the, um, what's it called? That you can run uh, scripts that came in remotely. Yeah, what was it? The remote yeah, the remote sign thingy. You run into that the first time you want to run something. Okay, what was that? You Google it, oh, remote sign. Okay. Of course you have to do this on the DBA system, but if you do this, the, the bottom one, then you need to remote sign on, on the box that you're running because you're giving PowerShell the command to run that script on that's located on the target machine to run that. Actually, you have to have the remote sign set there. Funny thing is, you can set the remote sign through remoting, and you can really weirdly, you can, if you run on a box, you have to put the remote sign, you have to confirm it, you have to type it into the so something and enter. You don't have to do that if you use PowerShell remote. So you can switch on um, the remote sign on all the machines with one command through remote. It's a bit weird. I don't know why that works that way, but anyway. Uh, so did I cover everything? Yeah. So run the enable PS remote everywhere. Um, it just starts the WinRM service, it uh, sets up a listener, and it will open up a port of the firewall. And disable PS remote does not undo all of that. It does disable uh, uh, you from running PS remote, but it does not, I, I don't think it plugs the firewall and it doesn't shut down the service. And, um, oh, and I'm mentioning a white paper on the last slide where I got a lot of good information. So, oh, I'll show you right now. Uh, here. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the bottom one. Before I forget to mention it, if you if you Google for PowerShell remoting, you you end up at uh, PowerShell.com or something, and there's a, a white paper on PowerShell remoting. That's not the one I'm uh, trying to mention here. If you Google for a layman's guide uh, to PowerShell uh, to remoting. So a layman's guide remoting with something in PowerShell in a, in, a, in a Google, or should I say Bing? I don't know. Who uses Bing? Well, all right. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, 
he, he ended up with this, this, this white paper, and it, I, I found it a lot more useful than the one that you find if you just Google for PowerShell every morning. You find a big white paper, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's good. It's good. I, I like this one a lot more. All right. Like I said, any questions? Just fine. <coughs> So, um, it can be a bit slow, because when you run a PowerShell command remotely, it will set up a remote session to run your command, and then uh, break it down, just shut down the remote session. You can keep the session open. You can say, I want an, um, a, a PowerShell session, and, and then I want an invoke command on the session. So you leave away the computer name, you just run on the session. And you can open up a session on multiple computers, just as you could with a computer name. That's really weird, yeah, right? You can open up a session, 10 machines, forgot which machines those were, things were, and just work on, on that session, and it, just, it fires off on those 10 machines. I'm not using this myself. I want to... It's, it's administrative scripts. It's okay if they're a bit slower, and they at least they clean up afterwards. I don't want to do this session stuff. It's, it can, can be handy. And also, um, if you want to uh, give some parameters to your scripts, that can be useful. Just give it an argument list command and, and give some parameters. And it will uh, feed the parameters inside the script that you're trying to run. So if you have a script that uh, runs something on a particular database and uh, you want to check some other database on there, you just feed the parameter to check with the database name or something. It's, it's up to you what you, what you, want to, what you want to do there. And also making it multi-threaded is really easy. The only thing you have to type behind it is as a job. And it will fire off a script as a, as a, as a job. Let me show you. Uh, where am I? If you do, for instance, um, invoke command uh, computer name SQL one script block get process, it will make a session. Try to connect to the other thing. This is a demo. Oh, I was going to say this is a demo, so now I get an error message. But no, it, it worked actually. And then uh, it will tear down the session again. You can do this in parallel uh, or in, in, um, in the background. If you just say as a job, it will fire it off, run in the background, and you can do this on a whole bunch of machines. Or run multiple jobs and multi thread it and just wait until they're done. And as you can see, it, it gives uh, different results. It now tells you that it has started a job. If I say uh, get job, um, in the first one it would say run, right. second one complete it, because it would just run in the background and you can just loop through get job, get job every five seconds or something if you have something long running on a whole bunch of sheets. That will just say complete it for, for, for the one that's done. And the only thing you have to say then is receive job and then the ID of the job or the name and you get the result set. That's, that could be pretty useful if you want to run this on 400 machines. I think it does 32 threads or something at the same time. Sure. And when one is done, it adds another one. You, you can make the number of threads higher. Um, Oops, tweaks uh, an administrative command until it's fast enough. All right. You probably. <laughs> anyway. uh, one other thing to uh, mind that's different from running it because if you read about it, they, they keep saying, well, it's the same as if you would run it locally. Not completely. You can see the PS computer name behind it. It adds that to the result set. And you can say that there's a command that you can, you can add to leave away the computer name command if you want to have a result set that does not have it. But then that's only for display purposes. If you save it, it will be there anyway. So you might as well learn to uh, live with it because it, it adds a few more. Also, 
the way PowerShell displays result sets, um, it has a knowledge somewhere of what to show if you, if you get a result set, if you get a command or something, or get, or get process. It, it gives you the um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7. Seven. It gives you seven columns here, and it has that information it's hidden somewhere. It knows to show these seven columns. There's more columns. You can add them if you want. Um, PowerShell may decide to. It will um, if you run if you run this command remotely, it will stream these this result set to the client where you run it from and assemble it again. And if it um, doesn't know its columns to show it might be different than what you normally see if you run it yourself. So the number of columns and the information you get may be different. Sometimes the column is missing, sometimes you get extra information. That's a bit weird, but that white paper tells you all about it. It tells you what, how you can see it and how you can fix it. Could be useful if you think I'm missing a column here. Yeah, that could be possible. <coughs> Full screen. Yep. I just did that. All right. <laughs> um, what I'm not showing is how you switch on that delegation stuff. That white paper tells you about it. You can do that yourself. Uh, how to use interactive sessions. I don't use it. I use it for interactive, uh, for administrative commands. If I want to check something on four hundred servers, that's how I use this. And um, there's also, um, so for, for instance, you have SCOM or um, SharePoint at your site. It needs libraries for, um, for PowerShell to work. You can import them on the DBA machine. So the DBA machine can run power, um, SharePoint commands without knowing how that works. And it doesn't need to run them on the SharePoint machine. It can import these commands and run them on a different box. It's really, it's a bit weird, uh, but I've used it to run SCOM uh, objects on a machine that did not have the SCOM client installed to put that machine in maintenance mode on the SCOM server. It's, that gets a bit more complex, but that white paper will show you about it. It's, um, it's a lot of work to figure that out. Oh, and um, yeah, the formatting of objects, that's the one with the column that I talked so if, you, if I've not run into many cases where that ha where that happened, but if you see that there's a difference in columns, you know where to look for that. That white paper will tell you. Why. And there's a, a link. oh, just a simple idea of how you can do this. This is a really basic thing. I'm not going to show you a script this big because it's too warm for that. Anyway, um, let me just show you an idea of what you can do. What I have is a um, list of instances, and in my case, SQL 1 and SQL 2, two virtual machines. I'm on the DBA machine, and the DC is a control. And I have a directory script, and one is called no backup in 24 hours. I just want to know. For all the servers, give me the list of databases that have not been We actually used it uh, years ago um, on, a, on a site with hundreds of instances. That was not PowerShell, but we set it up this way where we had lots of tiny scripts to check, lots of tiny things. And the idea is that you just don't, you don't run them once when you give the machine to someone and you say, here you go, this is your machine, run with it. You check it every time, every week or so. What we uh, did in the site where I work now was that if you give um, somebody orders a machine, a SQL server, you set up a SQL server according to your standards, and you give it something that's called an OAT, an operational acceptance test, where you go through all the checks. Are they, are they correct? It even involved making screenshots of stuff and put that in a document and make the guy who received it sign for it. It's really old fashioned. And then you give, it, give him the keys to the machine, the admin the, uh, password, and then we'll what we did with this system is if you have something that you want to check, like the, uh, the settings of memory, just keep checking them, keep checking them weekly. 
And then uh, on Monday morning you have uh, some emails in your mailbox on that server has them. They've been uh, using uh, weird memory settings. They have made a database with uh, one megabyte in size and 10% growth. And uh, it has been growing like a million times for it. Um, these things, you want to know these things. Right? So I built a lot of scripts and I've put them in directories that make sense to me. I've put another example with Brindos script. I've put that in here, but I'll show you later. Um, so I just have a PowerShell script that will open. Okay, yeah, there you go. This is it. This is all. Um, this is a complete monitoring system. <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't have all the error handling, and it doesn't email you when something is wrong. But this will run all those scripts in all those directories on all those servers and output the result to directories that are the same name of where the script is um, uh, set. So if I run, if, if I put a script in checks daily to 32, then the result of that thing will be in output severity. Let me delete that here so you can see that I'm not lying. The idea is that you decide for yourself whether it's, if something uh, is found in your script is important enough and you put that in severity 1 or severity 2 or however you want to name it, it's your naming convention. And my scripts only output something when it's wrong to when I want to know about it. If there's, if there's uh, nothing wrong on the box, the script will not output anything, you may want to put something in there that the script actually did want. Uh, so you know your monitoring system is working, you've got a monitoring, monitoring system, right? And um, so the no backup in 24 hours just gives a list of databases that have not been backed up in 24 hours. If a box, uh, if on a box all scripts, all databases have been backed up, you won't find it. You only get uh, stuff that's wrong. It, it saves you a lot of information to, allow for you to look through in the morning. Just get some error messages and that's it. So this, this is all that script does, and um, I'll, I'll post it somewhere. I don't know if it can be on the website, but I'll post it on my blog or something. It's, it's just an idea of how you can... How you can it. Would your server in down or non response so like you won't run out of things and not like to take down it, but you end up with the same like, like of that connection? Yeah, yeah so, so the question is what if your server is down so that there's not... The output is not actually, there was no backup of this database, but I couldn't connect to the server. You can either choose not to not to do anything with that, and then the, that is a result, and that result will be posted in the directory, and instead of a list of databases, you can find a connection error. But you can also catch that uh, error and put it in a different uh, error. It's up to you. This, this is just a few PowerShell commands, right? You can, Tweak it all you want, with that. and um, I've got a warning about that in the end, though, um, about building a monitoring system and go completely. So, very simple. Let me show you. Um, run, run checks. There you go. And we'll just go out, and I've sort of Brent Ozar has a script called SP Blitz uh, on his website that checks a whole lot of stuff on, on your server, and I've put that in there to, just to show you that you don't have to use my idea where you have a whole bunch of little scripts. You can just do the one script that checks everything up to you. And it will take a bit more. I mean, I've got three instances there. And then when it's done, you will see the result. Here, it's not done yet. There. So now you see the no backup result and the blitz result. So this, this just gives a, um, a list of databases that have not been backed up. And here you see the, uh, the columns that you get, whether you want to or not, you get many. So there is this command where you can say, uh, don't give me the computer name. It doesn't work when you save it to a file. You'll get the menu. So whatever you use to parse these, like for instance PowerShell import CSV, just filter out these columns. Use these, uh, or keep it really simple and just look inside the file. Make it as easy or as hard for yourself as 
if you want. That's the way to remember. <coughs> and I've, I've run that SP Blitz to show you that Brain Notes on a script actually gives it a lot more information, but that checks a whole lot of things in, in one go. Up to you, how, however you want to use it. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to set up, enable, to, to, to set up PowerShell remoting and how you use it. Up to you. So, one last warning. I've been in a site where a guy decided to write a monitoring script to monitor all the SQL servers, and he started writing scripts to collect information, put that in a database, make the database like those stupid one model catches all things with three columns that point to each other, and, and then write JavaScript to, to, to show the information. And I think he's been building on it for a year, and he's still working on it. Um, don't don't do that. Don't over engineer your own monitor because before you know it, you have to um, maintain your own monitoring system, and it becomes a. Uh, you, you spend uh, one guy of your team spends all his time doing that. Keep it really simple. I've seen it go wrong a couple of times. Don't over engineer these things. That's just practical advice from me. I've seen it go wrong so many times. I like the single function scripts, just the scripts that check one thing or one problem, as, as I mentioned in my SharePoint problem the, um, uh, at the beginning. I checked a couple of things, but it would just be to find one particular problem. You can even check the same thing in multiple scripts if that's part of that problem. Um, oh, and run these things regularly. <coughs> this, this is not for performance reasons. You're not checking how high is the CPU or something. No, you're checking if a SQL Server is configured right, if the box is configured right, if anything is, uh, is not the way you want to have it. That's what you check. And you check it on a weekly basis or a daily basis. You keep checking it. And then, um, because You've, been in, you've seen it in a circus, right? When you're spinning these plates. That's what it feels like if you have 400 servers. There's something going wrong every day. If you have a bunch of these scripts that just check for stuff that you know, if it's not set correctly, it will go wrong. I want to know about it. Just check these things automatically every day. Do something about it. You can keep up with the work. This, this is the only way. Well, not for PowerShell reloading, but for some system of checking them all. For instance, how much you're willing to keep up with 400 systems, even with, I think, 10 systems. If you have more than 10 or something, you need to do some automation. Um, it's not out yet, but PowerShell 3.0 will be there. Mm. Um, I'm not looking at when it will be there, I'm looking at the time. <laughs> or end of the session. Uh, PowerShell 3.0 will be in Windows Server 8, but it will also work for Windows Server 2008R. You can download it and install it there. Um, it's, I, I, like the, um, uh, I like the language a lot. PowerShell 3.0 is really cool. Um, one thing in um, combination with remoting, it has a really robust remoting that will survive, uh, shut down and reboot the server so it can continue. Really cool for setting up a, a server and installing stuff when you have, need a reboot. You don't have to disconnect, monitor it or something. You can just have your PowerShell remoting script with a shutdown and a reboot inside it, and it'll just reboot, connect, and continue, and you don't have to build anything on that. That's really cool. And um, other blog, the PowerShell.no, that's no, Norway, I think, right? uh, has some really nice overview of what's in there. And uh, the coolest thing, I think, is the PowerShell web access. This is an example on an iPhone. Uh, on your iPhone, you can just browse to a PowerShell command window and log on to a, a, a PowerShell remoting box, and from there, <laughs> remote everything. So imagine on, you're on a beach somewhere with your iPhone, shutting down 400 servers with your iPhone. <laughs> How cool is that, right? You get an email from your boss, you're fired. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about seven minutes, but it's, it's really nice to put it out there, so I'm, I don't want to keep you too long. If there are any questions? There are some fatigues running uh, command, uh, from the command from the shop. It doesn't work exactly like your uh, fatigues commands through the command line. Uh, I mean, especially.
especially with you know, using objects and properties of, of uh, methods on them, uh, bounding them uh, uh, using methods. <coughs> So when you fire something as a job, yeah, this is one of the one of the examples. I have you, are, you need to assign it to uh, a variable and then uh, use a method or property on that variable in the next step. So you cannot do all this stuff in one command. You know? Right. This is this is the problem of uh, running PowerShell uh, uh, commands from from specific job. Yes. So. If you assign something to a variable in a remote command and uh, run another remote command, that variable will be gone. Right? This is a different session. You can do that if you're in the same session. And uh, if you do it in the same session, it will also work when you're in a job, but not between jobs. Uh, uh, I'm in the one in the same job. Um, but um, I'm running uh, multiple commands on, right. the same, on, on the same object. You don't have to do this in, in one command, right? You can, yeah, no. This is this is one of the PowerShell commands. The only thing it does is it makes a SQL Server connection here and runs this script and then outputs the result. I know that there's an invoke SQL command uh, command that you can run on a SQL Server, but I found that even if a SQL Server setup supports this, depends on the PowerShell version that you have on those boxes. I'm just uh, I've just made a function that does that as well by using the SQL client. This works. A lot better for me. Again, if in your situation the SQL command works, use that. Um, I have not seen you. We can talk afterwards to see if we can. If you, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Anyways. All right, I think there's another. Where's the sponsor? There should be a sponsor. I saw the sponsor thing was at the beginning. I already know. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming out on your Saturday and this beautiful weather, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And um, thanks a lot.